king. That's where the Ten Commandments are. That's my chant for the day. Yeah, I won't do no more after that. Revelation, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 20. Um, I'm going to preach this one a little bit different than uh, I have the others. And I'm going to give you what I think are maybe my opinions. Um, I'm going to give you as much Bible fact as I possibly can. You know me. Um, but let me, let me just kind of get into where we're going this morning. Um, Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Let's read that passage this morning, and then you'll kind of get an understanding of what I'm trying to say this morning. I appreciate everybody being here. Appreciate those of you who are online. Appreciate those of you who are listening to us in Samburu and Turkana, Kenya. We want you to know that we love you. We thank God for you. And uh, God has given, God has blessed this church to unite our hearts with your hearts there in Kenya. We have many pastors in both Samburu County and in Turkana County, Kenya, that just love us to death. And they love hearing the messages. They love uh, what God has blessed this church with. They're very thankful for um, what we're attempting to do with them and helping them out and helping their brothers and sisters out and so on. And um, I never want to take that ministry for granted. And sometimes I'm guilty of doing that. I just want to say this morning to God that I am thankful that God above has given us such a wonderful ministry to be involved in. That all the things that God could have done with this church, He could have closed the doors on us years ago. That's been tried before. But God didn't do that. Um, God used us in a, in a great and mighty way and He's still doing it. And I want God to continue to do that for His glory's sake. For his honor's sake, for his kingdom's sake, and for the blessing of this church. God will bless this church if we'll follow his will. Amen? He will. And God, and God will curse us. God will chastise an entire church. Do you believe that? I believe he will. He can chastise an entire church if he wants. If that, if that church is not doing what God wants them to do, he'll chastise us. And uh, I've been on the chastisement side many times with my God, and I can tell you I don't, I don't look forward to the next time either. Let me read this, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Verse, the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I want you to think about, and I want you to look at every single word that is in this passage. I want you to look at what's there, and I also want you to consider what it doesn't say. What it doesn't say. Because we have received major criticism. In fact, uh, to the point of ministers going to both radio stations demanding that whoever is preaching against the Seventh-day Adventist belief be pulled off those radio stations. And um, they hate us. They despise us. They want us to go away. It would not surprise me to find out that the agent who was on the inside trying to dismantle our entire ministry in Kenya was not sent by one of several groups. 
It would not surprise me. Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, let me explain to you. Let's go to prayer. Father, before I begin talking to all the people, Lord, that will be listening to this, Lord, I ask sincerely, God, that you open my mouth, put the words in my mouth that you would have me to say. Father, that I would say them and I would preach the truth in love, in grace, in care and concern. We have people that not only follow our ministry, but I consider them friends of our ministry, friends of our church, my friends, who have, by your grace, come out of the Sabbath-keeping, the various Sabbath-keeping uh, doctrines, and have come to the truth of the gospel, that they are not saved by works. They are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Father, I thank you, Lord, for them. And so, Father, I want to have the same grace on those who are listening as you had on those, Father, whom you spoke to that you pulled out of that mess. Father, some of the people, there are people, Father, that many people in this church know right now. If I were to name their names, they would know them, that they have fallen into the, the heresy of Sabbath-keeping salvation. So, Father, open our hearts and open our minds. Help us, dear God, number one, to follow your counsel, follow your commandments. And to pray for those, Lord, who have replaced your commandments with a false gospel. Bless the preaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now I want to check on something real quick. Nope, it's not there. I want you to take your Bible and I want you to turn over to Genesis chapter 2. God mentioned specifically in this commandment that the purpose for the Sabbath day was modeled after his example when he created the earth. Now, I'm going to, as you turn to Genesis 2, we're going to be at the, the beginning of Genesis 2. I'm going to ask the question this morning, what day is the Sabbath day? What day is the Sabbath day? You are more than welcome to raise your hand and answer that question if you want to. What day is the Sabbath day? You know what? It's an easy question, but I think that you're not raising your hand because you're afraid that I'm going to disagree with you and... Or something. Some, there's a reason why nobody's raising their hand. John. It is the seventh day. What day is that? Saturday. Do we all agree that the seventh day of the week is the Sabbath day? 
It is not the first day of the week, which is today. Okay? Now, I don't know. I, I've heard this phrase, the Christian Sabbath. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've heard that phrase as a child growing up in church but could never find that in Scripture. Now, why are we here on the first day of the week instead of the seventh day of the week? I will explain that to you. Number one, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That's a good principle. Somebody say amen. Today is the first day of the week. What better day to put everything else aside that we could be doing today and come into his house and start the week off worshiping the Lord, praising his name, praying in his name, confessing our sins, Praying for sinners, praying for healing for people, anointing people so that they can be healed. What better day than to serve the living God than on the first day of the week and give that day to him and he's promised he would bless the whole rest of the week after that one. Now that's, real, that's reason number one why I'm here today. It is a tradition of churches, but I want you to notice that you are going to be hard-pressed in Scripture to find any place in the Bible where it commands us as New Testament Christians that we must worship on the first day of the week. You're going to be hard-pressed to find that in Scripture. Now, you have Scripture examples that of what the early church did, but out of the apostles' mouth, out of our Savior's mouth, out of God's mouth, you find no commandment. Do you know why I think there's no commandment? Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Kid. Is it not possible that if we needed to, if we had to, if we wanted to, we could get together this Tuesday morning and have the same service we're having today? Could we do that? Would God be just as blessed and praised and honored by our worship of Him on Tuesday morning as He would today? Where we could worship God, there is no commandment from God telling you that you must worship only on one day of the week. You cannot come together as a church service on any other day of the week. And yet that's what the Seventh-day Adventist cult and the Sabbath-keeping salvation cults, the Hebrew roots, that's what they say the Sabbath day is all about. But let's look at what God said. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, what did God do? God ended his work, which he had made. And he, what else did he do? He rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And what else did he do? Verse 13, God blessed the seventh day. Did he not? And did he not because that in it he had, why did he bless it? Because he rested. He rested from all this work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and did what to it? Sanctified it. He made it holy. Because that in that he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now as I compare Genesis 2, 1 through 3 with Exodus 20 verses 8 through 11. You know what I see in both places? That number one, God set aside one day out of seven for, to give man rest. 
Number two, I do not see a single commandment anywhere in either Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, or Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, where God said, you must congregate, gather together on the Sabbath day and worship in my holy place. Can you find that not only in these two verses, but anywhere else in the Bible? I actually can, well, I won't say I did it. The Holy Ghost did it. A lady called our ministry years ago, and she said she was Seventh-day Adventist, and she challenged me, and I've had other people challenge me before on the phone, and I, and I give them the same, I ask them the same question. Answer me this question. And I said to her, can you show me in the law, in, Gen in the Ten Commandments, where God said that I must worship in church only on the seventh day, and I am prohibited from worshiping in church on any other day? And that you could have, I heard the crickets in the background. And finally she admitted, I don't know of any place in the Bible that says that. I said, then you believe the lie. Because you were told that God commands us that we must get together on the Sabbath day and we must worship him only on the Sabbath day. And those who get together on, the, on Sunday to worship God will receive the mark of the beast because they're all heretics and they're all going to die and they're all going to go to hell. And she said, you know what, you're right. She passed away believing from that day forward. She passed away believing that she was then saved by God's grace, not because she was going to church on Saturday, Brother George. She died here several years ago, and she died right. You know what God did? God made her free from the bondage that she was in. Now, I will tell you this. Let me, let me, in fact, let me define, let me define, let, let, no, let the Bible define what it means by labor. Is it wrong to brush your teeth on Saturday? No, for heaven's sake, brush your teeth on the Sabbath. Is it wrong to comb your hair on the Sabbath day? Hear this, young people, children, comb your hair on... Is it wrong to bathe on the seventh day? Is it wrong to cook a meal on the seventh day? God told him. This is what he said, Numbers 29, 12. You look this up in the Bible. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, you shall have an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work, and you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. By labor, he means no servile work. What he means by that is the labor that we do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to earn our paycheck or to farm our farm or whatever it is that we do. do. Now, obviously, is it against the law to milk cows on the Sabbath day? Cows don't know a Sabbath day. Cows have to be milked how many days? Seven days a week. Okay? But he said, do no, what he meant was do no servile work. And I, I'm just going to touch on this and then I'm going to move on. Because I've preached this before. I believe in a Sabbath day still. I believe that, in fact, let me read the scriptures to you. Turn to Matthew 12. Here's what Jesus said said about this and this is the example that he gave us in Matthew chapter 12 verse 10 
Behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on Sabbath days, that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Now, doesn't that make sense? Because it's not servile labor. And he said, how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. And he stretched it forth and it was restored whole like as the other. And he did it on the Sabbath day. He did it right. Amen. Now, 2 Corinthians verse 11. Here's what we are told to watch for. I don't know if this is... Yeah, I don't have all the notes that I thought I had in here. I don't know. I must have downloaded the wrong message or something like that. But I had added some extra notes to this. Um, trying to remember what Jesus said. Where is it that's written? Somebody help me out here since my notes aren't here. Where is it that Jesus said that the Sabbath was given for man and not man for the Sabbath. Somebody look that up for me. Where is that in Scripture? The Sabbath was given to man and not man to the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath day is a gift to us. Like the other commandments are. They're given to us that if we do them, there's a blessing in it. Who can find that? Where is that? Mark 2.27. 2, Everybody turn there. That sounds about right. In fact, let's go, let's go back into... Um, let's go back a little bit. Verse 23. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is, un is not lawful? Verse 25. He said unto them, Have ye never read what David did when he had need and was hungered? He, ha and, he, and, and they that were with him? He went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and did eat the shewbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest, and gave also to them which were with them. And he said unto them, The Sabbath, listen now, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath day. Somebody say amen. God gave you as a benefit to you. A day in which it is not required of you to work your servile labor work one day a week. You get a day to not have to go to work. The labor laws that are founded in this country are actually founded on biblical concepts. We typically call the work week Monday through Friday to allow, number one, for those who are Jewish to, to not work the Sabbath day. Number two, for those who want to go to church on Sunday, to go to church on Sunday and not have to worry about missing work on Sunday. The labor laws in this country are built upon the Word of God. Somebody say amen. And I can tell you, in my younger years here, I would try to, I would tell myself, I got to get as much done as I possibly can. And I would find myself over here every single day of the week. I would find myself here seven days a week. And God dealt with me and said, Mike, that's not right. You're breaking a commandment. I gave you a day to rest. And I expect you to use it. 
It wasn't a suggestion either. It was a commandment. I want you to rest. Now, I'm not going to get into the prophetic picture of it, how it's a, it is a picture. God has, has uh, ordained a rest that is coming for a thousand years. The Bible says a thousand years is with the Lord a day, and a day is as a thousand years. And I believe there is going to be a Sabbath thousand years that God is going to lay this earth to rest and he's going to bless mankind by not having devils all over us for a thousand years. Somebody say amen. I get tired of fighting. If I get tired, I'm tired of fighting devils all week. Amen. But I, I want to encourage you, if your lifestyle has you working seven days a week and it is by your own choice, cut it out. Because God will find a way. You think, well, I'm gaining. I'm gaining on this day. If I, if I throw in this extra day to work, I'm, I'm earning more money. I guarantee you God will find a way to get it out of your hand. You're going to lose your tires, radiator, fan belt. Radia the the uh, transmission's going to fall out of your car. Guarantee you. God's going God's to find a way to snatch it right out of your hand. So, you know, I recommend picking a Sabbath day. If, if there, thank God that there are ambulance drivers driving on Saturday and Sunday. And if you cannot get off on Saturday or Sunday, pick a day, but take a day off. Those of you who run a business, take a day off. Amen? Now, again, did we see anywhere in the scriptures where this Bible told us that we must get together only on Saturday to worship and that we are forbidden on any other day of the week to get together to worship God? Did we see that anywhere in any of these verses? Have you ever read that in the Bible anywhere? Sure, they had holy convocations. They would sound the trumpet. Everybody would get together. Generally, those were feasts. Okay? And, um, but as far as the Sabbath day, the seventh day, God gave the... I, in fact, here's the conversation that I had with a man one time. He's arguing with me. And I said, did you see anywhere in there where it said that we, are, we have to go to church on the Sabbath day? And he said, yes. I said, tell me where it says that. And he said, in that it said it's a holy day. And he said, the only way to make it a holy day is for us to gather together and worship him on that day. I said, you added that to scripture. You made that up. You did not read that from the Bible. The Bible says that God's way, God's way of you keeping the Sabbath day holy is by resting. Not by getting together in a church service to worship Him. I'm going to read some things to you this morning from Ellen White. And this is going to go, one of the things that I noticed, my first trip to Kenya, was that there were Seventh-day Adventist churches everywhere in Kenya. And I thought, these people, they're being lied to. And in both Samburu and Turkana, the Seventh-day Adventist pastors have ganged together to try to get me off of the radio stations that this church owns. And the people told him, we can't take him off the radio station. He owns the station. The, the church owns the station. We can't take him off. Because they didn't like what I was saying. You know what they don't want? They don't want the competition. They're telling everybody you have to work and you must do what we tell you to do in order for you to go to heaven. And I'm here telling everybody else you don't have to do nothing except trust in the cross of Jesus Christ. 
He fulfilled the Sabbath. He gave us rest. Somebody rest in Jesus. Somebody say amen. Here's what, here's what uh, Ellen White said. We believe the revelation and inspiration of both the Bible and Ellen White's writings to be of equal quality. That's the Seventh-day Adventist church. The superintendence of the Holy Spirit was just as careful and thorough in one case as in, as in another. Christ bore our own sins in his body on the tree according to the Bible. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Become a, a, a Seventh-day Adventist and it will be Satan who will eventually bear your sins. Ellen G. Wright wrote this. So Christ will place all these sins upon Satan the originator and instigator of sin, so Satan, bearing the guilt of all the sins, which he has caused God's people to commit, will be for a thousand years confined to the earth, which will then be desolate. What a liar. She said, Satan bore your sins, not Christ. That's a lie. Now let me read to you what, where she got her gospel from. In fact, turn, do this. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. No, three. No, one. Galatians 1. I'll get it right in a minute. Galatians chapter 1. Paul said in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Where did Joseph Smith say he got the directions for finding those golden tablets? From an angel from heaven, the angel Moroni told him where he could find those golden tablets that he alone translated all by himself. Now we have Ellen White telling us that an angel, here's this what Ellen White said, an angel told her. Um, she said, uh, I'm going to kind of highlight it, I want you to see where my finger is, or just trust that I'm reading it to you right. I saw an angel flying swiftly to me. He quickly carried me from the earth to the holy city. In the city I saw a temple which I entered. I passed through a door before the, uh, the candlestick with seven lamps and the table on which the, was the showbread. After viewing the glory of the holy, Jesus raised the second veil and I passed into the, the holy of holies. I'm already blasphemed out. I can't, t I can't take no more. Verse, now here's what she said. In the holiest I saw an ark. On the top and the sides of, of it was purest gold. On each side of the ark was a lovely cherub with its wings spread over it. Their faces were turned toward each other and they looked downward. Between the angels was a golden censer. Above the ark where the angels stood was an exceeding bright glory that appeared like a throne where God dwelt. Jesus stood by the ark and as the saints' prayers came up to him, the incense in the censer would smoke and he would offer up our prayers with the smoke of the incense to his father. In the ark was uh, the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of stone which folded together like a book. Jesus opened them. Watch this. Now listen to what she says here. She said he took the Ten Commandments. I saw the Ten Commandments written on them with the finger of God. On one table were four, and on the other, six. The four on the first table shone brighter than the other six. Does the Bible say that anywhere? That one commandment is more worthy to keep than any other commandment. If a man offends the law at one point, he is guilty of all the Bible says. She's already a liar and a heretic. And then she said... The Holy Sabbath. Uh, but she said, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, shone above them all. For the Sabbath was set apart to be kept in honor of God's holy name. The Holy Sabbath looked glorious. A halo of glory was all around it. I saw the Sabbath commandment was not nailed to the cross. That is an exact, that is a complete contradiction to what Paul wrote in Colossians. That Christ took the commandments that was against us, nailed all ten of them to his cross. Somebody say amen. She says the fourth commandment 
of Sabbath keeping was not nailed to the cross. Therefore, if you want to be saved, you must go to a Seventh-day Adventist church on Saturday. That's it. Angers me when I have to preach against other gospels. I get I get wound up. Because you know why? It's bondage. It's bondage. You remember when COVID ran through our church? And we spent how many weeks not here? Three weeks? What if Wayne died during that time? Did he go to heaven because he didn't go to church on the Sabbath? He broke the commandment. Did he go to heaven? He's there now. I don't like false gospels. As far as the seventh day and the Sabbath, the Sabbath keeping, the Sabbath salvation keepers, I'll call them. The Jesus of the Jehovah's Witness, Jesus Christ is not God, rather he is Michael the Archangel. In the Seventh-day Adventist, the Holy Spirit is not a person but an active force. JWs are Unitarians denying the Trinity. In Jehovah's Witness, when you're dead, you're dead. Man has no eternal soul any more than animals. Jesus Christ was not raised bodily from the grave but was recre recreated as a new spirit body. Jesus returned invisibly in 1914. There was no visible coming planned in the future. Number six, there is no hell just like animals. When we die, it is over. Number seven, only 144,000 people achieve heaven. You thought this was just, yeah, this is Jehovah's Witness. The rest faithful witness who have died will be re recreated on earth during the kingdom of the new world. The Seventh-day Adventist, and the Je Jesus of the Jehovah's Witness are all the same. Math Mark chapter 2, we read that. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, in verse 27, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now, I just want to encourage you this morning. Number one, whatever your reasons are, you can justify it all you want to. But God commanded us, including us preachers, take a day off. Did Jesus do that? Did Jesus retreat from everybody and get alone to himself? Why? Because he had to. His mortal body recognized that he could not keep up ministering to people seven days a week. He couldn't do it. He had a mortal body just like we did. So my encouragement to you is, number one, take a day off. Take a day off. And number two, do not, now, and I may be, you guys may be okay, some of you listening online, I don't know everybody. But what I know is that online, the false gospels have found new breeding grounds. And the Seventh day salvation people, which are the Hebrew roots, the Seventh day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witness, and all of them other cults who are telling you that you are going to hell because you go to church on the same day those nasty Catholics do, therefore you're going to hell and you're going to receive the mark of the beast. Don't let those people lie to you. Know your Bible. Know that God set you free. In coming here this morning, did I call you and say, if you don't show up today, I'm going to kick you out? Never happened. Tell God thank you for the liberty that you have. 
You came here not because you had to. You came here, why? Because you wanted to. And that's the difference. Father in heaven, we come before you today. We thank you, dear God, for the lessons learned. We thank you, dear God, for the word of God that shows us all the doctrines that are right and true, the ones that you bless, the ones that you curse. And Father, that Sabbath day salvation doctrine is a doctrine right out of hell. You know it. Ellen White received it from an angel, just like Paul warned, just like Joseph Smith did. And Father, we pray, dear God, Lord, that you would forgive us of the sin of not taking the rest on the Sabbath day that we should. Not taking a day off to let our bodies and our minds rest. And not, while we're resting, not spending time in your word, thinking of what you're telling us, doing a little praying that day too. There's no work in that. There's no labor in that. Father, if we're not careful, the devil will fill our lives with everything in the world to do except rest. Now, Father, we ask God, Lord, that you just instill it in our hearts to do what's right, do all the commandments. Not just the ones we want. And Father, Lord, for those, Lord, who are caught out in the bondage of pretended law keeping. God, would you save someone out of that bondage today. By the preaching of your word. Bless your word. Bless these people today. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. Amen. 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 Amen.